I'm Nancy Pearl. Welcome to Book Lust. My guest today is author Elizabeth McCracken, and we'll be talking about, among other things, her new book, The Hero of This Book. Elizabeth, it's so great to get to interview you. I just wish it were in Seattle so we could go out to tea together. I know, but it's wonderful to see you. It is as, yes, yes. So, as you know, I have been a fan of yours since your very first book, Here's Your Hat, What's Your Hurry? A collection of short stories. And it was one of the books that was an American Library Association notable book. And the reason, I, I take full credit for it, for it being a notable book, because I, I insisted that everybody sit down at lunch together, and I read them the first story and everybody was as taken with it as I was. So thank you for, um, for that early, early introduction to your work. Well, thank you. I, 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 feel, I feel silly that I have not realized that it was you all along, because um, the book was, shall we say, quietly published at the imprint closed before. And I remember when I, when I heard about the ALA notable book because you as you know I'm a I'm a former public librarian yes um and so I, I was actually working in the library when when I heard about that uh the Somerville Public Library and it meant a lot to me well I just um so I followed your career with great with great with great admiration and affection and your new book so I've, I've started talking to people who have read the book, and one of the things that, that they find so interesting about it and so, um, so what makes it so good for a book group, I think, for book group discussion is, is it a memoir or is it a novel? And I know you talk about this in the book, but could you talk about how you regard it or how you regarded it when you were working on it? Yeah, I mean, at first when people asked me that question, I would pick up a copy of the book and tell this is a novel right there, legally yeah. binding. <laughs> uh, and it was, I, I knew that it would be a novel, but it's about my actual mother who cannot be mistaken for any other human being who ever lived. And so lately I've been thinking, it's a, it's a novel about writing a memoir about my actual mother. Oh, yeah. But that's too many words to put on the front cover. She didn't let me do it. Exactly. <laughs> she wouldn't let me do it. Did you know that you were going to do that? I, I know that in, in, in that first book of col that collected in your first story, collection of stories, Here's Your Hat, What's Your Hurry? One of the stories is The Secretary of State. Which, which I have always wanted you to turn into a novel. But, um, but when we talked about it, when we met, when you and I met, you said that that was really, that really happened. It was one of the few stories, or maybe only story, that was really based on real, real life. The, the characters, the, the large things that happened to the characters are not based on real life, but my Grandmother Jacobson was from a family with 11 brothers and sisters who loved to argue about absolutely everything. And I grew up with the stories about the Bernsteins um, my whole life, including both how when you went into my aunt Edna's house, she would follow you around demanding what you wanted to, to eat. And then you would feel something, you'd turn it down, you'd, then you'd feel something cold at your elbow. You'd say, what is this? And she'd say, it's the ice cream you asked for. <laughs> and there's a story in it about um, them all arguing about who would run the government when they would, when they were inevitably put in charge. And that, in fact, my father, who's not the father in that story, said, um, I'd like to be secretary of state. And my Aunt Edna was very rude about it. And then she literally called him at the restaurant because my mother and I, he went out um, to apologize and say that that he could be Secretary of State if he wanted to. They were watching my brother and they thought the baby, something terrible has happened to the baby. No, just, but... 
So did you, I mean, did you, did you plan, did you know you were going to write this book or did this come as a surprise? Do, do you know what I mean? Is that a reasonable question? No, it's a totally reasonable question because there are definitely books that I know that I'm going to write, um, even if it's just that I think, oh, I have some time off from my from my teaching job. This is the right, it's time for me to start a new novel. And I sit down and I start. And this novel, um, I was I was in London, as the narrator is, walking around the city and thinking as my narrator is <laughs> about my mother who had died a year before and whose memorial service I had just been to. And I had been, my husband, Edward Carey and I were we in our kids, we were in a house in Clarkenwell um, in London and we had, it was, we rented a whole little house and I was trying to get some stories off the ground and they were just not working. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll write about this thing that I'm thinking about. And I knew it was a novel that I wanted it to be a novel. It was that I didn't write a, no a book and then try to decide what it was going to be. Um, but it did, t it totally surprised me. And it was, and this is not uncommon with my novels. When I write short stories, I know what's going to happen in them. But novels, I know a lot less. I mean, maybe it's just a a, a bigger cave with a more dimly lit. Um, but I didn't know how I was going to write it until until I wrote it. In the end, was it was it an easy novel to write, or were there big decisions that you found that you inevitably had to make? It, it, it was easy and it wasn't easy. Um, I was very aware as I was writing it that my own mother was very, very private and might not like the idea wow. of me writing a book. And I, I felt quite a bit of trepidation over that, but I decided, which is sort of generally what I do, listen, I'll write it and then I'll figure it out later. Because if I'm always worrying about, is this right or is it wrong, then I won't advance or have any more complicated thoughts about it. But at the same time, it was such a pleasure to think about my mother that it was in that way it was quite easy and the way that it was it came out the shape of it was quite easy you know I didn't plot it out um, and the only thing that was different and somewhat difficult is that the original version of it uh, I imagine with footnotes or end notes that were about writing and the main character was not a writer and didn't talk about writing all of that all of the sort of thinking about writing fiction versus memoir was in the footnotes. Um, and that was a, it was a clever idea that did not pan out. That was too clever. That it didn't, it didn't fit into the novel itself. And one of the things that I realized, I think I was, I was leery of putting much of myself into the book at all. And so I had sort of hidden it in the footnotes and everything that's, and I was keeping myself quite safe, I think, in the first draft of the book. And the most difficult part was, I realized the footnotes wouldn't work, um, but I also knew that the book needed something of that. And so I took about 10% out and put it into the, into the novel itself. And that I really did sort of think, I felt very exposed. I mean, for about, as we writers do, you know, for a good two weeks and now it doesn't bother me anymore. But the, anything that is, personal that's about me, um, or I should say the narrator, the narrator who seems a lot like me, um, <laughs> was was some of the last stuff that I did. I actually would have liked to have had that with footnotes. That's exactly the kind of thing that I would just enjoy. And and the way the way that you play the way that you've moved it into the, the book itself I appreciated those parts of the book a lot. I, I guess we should just say the the one the one fact that I knew about your mother before I read the book was that she had invented the mojito. Yes, the self-proclaimed inventor of the mojito. Oh, well, we should give her credit. Yes. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I always. Um, 
people who sort of say, so who were you influenced by? And I always think, I don't know who I was influenced by, but I have realized with this book, both in terms of footnotes and the phrase of the, the self-proclaimed inventor of the mojito, the first influence is Nicholson Baker's The Mezzanine, which is a book that I just loved and uh, and still love. I love Nicholson Baker. And I read when I was in graduate school and it's about a journey and it's got a ton of footnotes um, in a brilliant way. It's just, it's, yeah. I think it might, might be the first novel I read that was heavily footnoted. And the whole journey is just an escalator ride. Right, to buy a, to buy a shoelace, right? I can't remember whether, whether he's going up or down. Much either. Oh, so good that book. <laughs> yeah, that. And the second is Calvin Trillon, who was also one of my mother's favorites. And I feel like he um, enjoys giving people um, running joke nicknames, and his work is full of running jokes. And I love running jokes. And I feel like this book is my book is is too the Calvin Trillon influence. You talk about um, in the book the na not you the narrator talks about um, never want thinking that that she would never write another memoir, and in fact <clears throat> there is a memoir that you wrote um, very moving. Why is it partly because your books are quirky is one of my highest compliments that I can give a book. Um, you know, wonderful writing characters that just you get to know, and a little bit of quirkiness is is my. That's that's what I that's what I love. And your books, all your books, short stories and novels alike, fulfill that for me. So I have to thank you for doing that for writing those books. But that memoir m must have been um, quite a change from your novels and your short stories. And what, why did you think you, what impelled you to, to write that, if, if we can talk about it? Oh, right. yeah, no, absolutely. One of the, when you write about something and put it in a book, or at least when I write about something and I put it in a book, it means I can talk easily about, okay. about it. And the, the book is about the soul birth of my husband and my first child. And I wrote it in that sort of compulsive way, I think, Maybe not all writers do this, but if the only if there's a line in in this book that says talks about putting things into sent arranging facts into sentences, which is the only way I've ever understood anything in my life. And when I wrote my memoir, then I didn't know whether I was writing a novel or a memoir. I thought I was I thought I was taking notes for a novel that I would write later on. And then when I was done with it, and it was incredibly useful for me. Um, I really think writing it saved me. Uh, I also realized, well, I'm done with that. <laughs> I've been through the whole thing. And when I gave it to my early readers, it was to say, first I gave it to my husband just to see how he would feel about it being out in the world. And if he'd said, no, thank you, I would have gone, of course, I totally understand. Um, but I knew that if I hadn't gotten it right is the wrong word. If it wasn't a book, I wasn't going to revise it. Mm -hmm. I would have said it serves my purpose. And I wrote it in three weeks, which is also, I've never written anything that quickly. Mm -hmm. Is it, when, when an idea comes to you, is that what you start with an idea or a character or a place or what? what's usually the first thing that comes to you when you know that you have this piece of fiction in your in in your mind or your body or your DNA that you need to get out, you know it's so funny because the here's your head, what's your hurry? Next year will have been thirty years since I published my first book. And if you told me then it would shift all the time, I wouldn't have you know I would have said this is the kind of writer I am. The first thing I have is a sentence in the voice of the narrator. 100% I would have said that about um, writing in that collection is there's one third person story, but all the rest are first person stories. Um, and almost everything, and then for a long time, a lot of things that I wrote came from photographs that have stuck in my head. The Giant's House comes from a photograph of Robert Pershing Wadlow that I was obsessed with in the 
you know, spoke of world records. But um, I mean, sometimes with the with Bowl Away, the first thing I had was the names, which I copied out of my grandfather's genealogies. And then the next thing I had before I knew who those names belonged to was I thought, I really want to write a book about a Candlepin bowling alley. Um, yeah, it just shifts. And this sort of, this really was, I, I left uh, something out when I said I started to write it, which is that I saw um, my good friend, Emer McBride, who wrote a girl's a half form thing. Um, and she, we were in London and she was about to publish Strange Hotel. And she said, oh yes, I just wrote this small, you know, sort of semi-auto fictional book. And I was like, that sounds great. Why aren't I doing it? <laughs> um, and so for the first time, I would actually say the genesis of this book, um, which I've never done before, is I wanted to try a form of some kind. When, a, when one of those things comes to you, how do you know whether it's going to be a novel or a short story? It's interesting. For me, it is instantaneous. And part of it probably has to do with whoever I think the characters are. To me, that's the big difference between short stories and novels is sort of the size of the characters. So if there's somebody who I think I can't get to the bottom of in a short story, then it's a novel. I also generally speak when I'm working on a novel, I just try to cram everything that occurs to me into the novel. I don't, I don't stop because I've got an idea for a short story. I might, if my teaching load is heavy, I might um, put a novel aside and then sort of go, oh, I have time for a short story, but. What, what do you tell your students about, um, about the difference between writing a novel and writing short stories besides the time it's gonna take you to do it? That honestly is the main thing. But I do, I was, I was talking to a, um, a wonderful student of mine, uh, former student, Cindy Abanu, who's, she's on the Carnegie long list um, with an astonishing collection of uh, um, short stories called Seeking Fortune Elsewhere. And she, you know, she, she was talking about writing a novel and she was like, I don't know, you know, but I've, I'm writing all these short stories. I've almost got another collection. Um, and I said, which is something I really believe, is which is that when you when you have a novel idea you'll you'll know it if you especially if you are a a natural short story writer and drawn to the form that at some point you'll have an idea and you'll just know that it's a novel story you know that you will need to spend a much longer time to understand it understand the people and what it means in in the in the olden days it used to be that a writer would publish a work of, you know, a collection of short stories, and everybody would be looking forward to the novel that was coming. But in a way, that seems to have changed, um, in the sense that many people, I learned this on Twitter, many people are like reading, a, like the short story form maybe has come back into its own. Do, do you think that's the case, or what do you think? I mean, I think it sort of, it, Truthfully, and I'm not speaking as somebody in the world of publishing because I don't know what sells and what doesn't sell. Right. But I think people sort of, and it's pronounced if you're on social media, everybody has this idea they're like, oh, nobody's interested in short stories. And they tell each other that, which may make it a little true, but I, I sort of feel like the short story, um, I think the, um, I, th I think it's never gone away. I think. Mm -hmm. Um, there may be a year where, where the big books are all big books. I do think that um, I wish that uh, short stories were more regularly considered for big awards because quite often there there will be no short stories. I think there is a, at least one collection of short stories on the National Book Award mm -hmm. um, finalist list. Um, and I also, I love connected stories. I hope they don't eclipse collections that are not connected. I like both. They seem like different forms. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do live in a sort of verified world in which people really like short stories. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I'm always running across people in, in, re, in 
IRL or on social media who are talking about reading a short story a night. I mean, that's what they're doing for, you know, they see that there. And that, it seems to me, is very, it's, it's exciting in a way. I mean, I always look forward to the best American short stories to see kind of what I've missed. Um, and I just judged an award where two of the three finalists were collections of short stories. So that was really interesting. Um, but it seems, it seems as though, that, well, I guess there, yeah. I mean, I don't know what's, what's selling and what's not selling except for, except for the big book. So let's talk about what you read when you're not writing, you're not teaching, you're not being a mom, a wife. What do you read? Well, at the at the moment, um, I have been reading student novels. Um, mm -hmm. I've had a I, I, oh, I can plug a bunch actually, because this is this year and next year. I have so many former students um, from all periods of my life with books that have come out or are coming out. So, um, Yun Lee who was my student a million years ago. I taught her nothing because um, she really knew everything. <laughs> the Book of Goose is a book I absolutely love. And Paul Harding from around the same time has a beautiful book called, and I'm going to blank on it because it's not, it's got a new title. I think it's called This Other Eden. Yes, I think um, that's what it's called. Yeah. And it's quite beautiful. And he was a student as well? Yeah. Oh my. Um, <laughs> And uh, and I, what I can take credit for is he, when he was my student, he was working on two novels or he had two ideas for novels. And one was a novel excerpt that I'd read. And the other was, do you think I should turn that uh, story I have about like cl the clockmaker into a novel? And I was like, the one. <laughs> so that's my hand in tinkers. <laughs> um, yes, I think you should, I said. Um, and I... Um, there's a there are several books coming out next year. Leg by Greg Marshall, The Bandit Queens by Perini Shroff, Night Wherever We Go by Tracy Rose Payton, The Great Reclamation by Rachel Heng. Which, no, I'm forgetting some other great books that I have read um, by students. Um, the Caretakers by Amanda Bester Siegel, which came out earlier in this year and is a fantastic book. Cindy's book, Seeking Fortune Elsewhere, is wonderful. Well, when you're when you're reading and the students' novels, what are what are they hoping for, and what are you what are you able to do? All writers hope that the person will say, "Oh my God, that's perfect!" Right. I and will give you a publishing contract myself right now. <laughs> right. But I, but I, the second thing I think they want is because with a, a novel, short story you can hold in your own head and sort of have some idea of what it's like. But um, novel writing is such a strange and private thing um, that I, I, one of the things that I can do, because I really like reading novels and I tend to read them in a short period of time for a student, is to just describe it to them. To say, this is what your book is doing, um, this is its shape, this is its structure, maybe this is where the structure is a little wonky, um, this is what I think the plot is, These are here are the characters. Um, and then and then to have a conversation about what they intend with the book. And I do, you know, also say, I hate it when you use gift as a verb. Don't. <laughs> it's a very, I also really, it's my great pleasure to find anachronisms in historic novels. <laughs> Right. So, so when you're reading the book, you're actually interrogating the fiction, right? Yeah, a bit. I, the first time I read a book, I read it without a pen in my hand, so I'm not marking it up, so I can have a sort of a readerly experience with it. But I am trying to, to get a sense a sense of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think w w um, the way I'm understanding what you're saying is that what the students really want is somebody to listen to what they've written. Yeah. And and um, and and what a gift that is to have you, to have you Elizabeth McCracken as the teacher, I think that's absolutely um, wow. That that's so fortunate for those students. Do you do you have a list of novels that do you, that you plan 
to write or, you know, little ideas? Do you keep a notebook or? I really don't. I have, I was just actually looking at it the other day. I have a little, no, I, so I wrote quite a bit of the hero of this book in the fall of 2020. I'd started it in this, in the summer of 2019. And then I, I'd had to put it aside to finish writing this, the book that I was actually contracted to write, which is the souvenir museum. Um, but I was on leave in, in the fall of 2020 and, uh, I don't know. I found myself with a lot of free time on my hands in the fall of 2020. Uh, and so I, I wrote a second little, very small novel, but that's not right. And I, I was, I went back and looked at it the other day and I was hoping that I'd go, oh my God, this is so much better than I thought. And I looked at it and I went, oh, you know, it might be interesting, but there's something, something not quite right about it, which is what I, I've sort of known. I hadn't looked at it. So mm -hmm. I may go to that, but I don't, I don't, I feel like uh, novel ideas have to sort of come upon me. And even if I if I'd thought about one but didn't have time to write it, that that feeling would dissipate by the time I started to write it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm always reminded of C.S. Lewis's statement that there's not a cup of tea big enough for a, a, a piece of fiction long enough um, to to uh, to satisfy him. So he was he was not a short story fan. I I I. Um, I guess. Um, Elizabeth, thank you so much for being on the show. And um, I look forward to your next book and your next book and your next book and on and on and on. So, and congratulations on the hero of this book, which I think is absolutely marvelous. Thank you. It's always a joy to talk to you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.